Howdy folks, Spencer here, and today I'll be going over the Plasma Delkina build that I've been working on for the past couple of months. And in this video, I'll also be recapping some of the recent meta changes that have enabled Plasma to push ahead of both phasers and disruptors to become the top energy damage type in Elite content. As always, chapters are listed down below. And before I get too far into things, for those of you that want a general picture of the build to reference back to, here you go. Now, I am about to spend the first 13 or so minutes of this video explaining some of the recent meta changes and explaining some of the things that have been introduced into the game that have allowed Plasma to become as effective as it now is. So if you want to hear that explanation, then have at it. But if you want to skip ahead directly to the build discussion, that timestamp is linked down below, and I'll have that up on the screen now for those of you that want to jump right over to that section. The first thing that I want to talk about today is why I decided to go with Plasma and why I decided to use the Delkina as the platform to push Plasma to its maximum potential. And with regards to Plasma, earlier this year Cryptic introduced the Gorn Hunter Pilot Raider to the Infinity Lockbox. On the Gorn Hunter, there is a Starship trait, console, experimental weapon, and quad cannon that each provide a boost to Plasma. And unfortunately, this is not a small boost, so if you're looking to replicate this build and get anywhere near the DPS numbers that I was seeing, then you're going to need to get the Gorn Hunter for the items on it. If you're just looking to set up a plasma build that can just get through content, then you can live without those items, but if you're wanting the DPS numbers, then getting those is quite essential. And the next thing I want to take a look at is the accessories off of the Gorn Hunter to help you understand why they are so important for a plasma build like the one being shown in this video. Starting off at the left is the Starship trait Complex Plasma Fires. This trait is a stacking plasma dot that your plasma weapons can apply to any foes you hit while a firing mode is active. Firing modes mean something like Beam Overload or Cannon Scatter Volley are actively running on your build at the time. Each plasma weapon on your build is able to apply one stack of this trait per firing cycle to each foe hit. So if you have a cannon that hits three foes during its firing cycle, then each of those foes would have one stack of the trait applied to them. You can get up to 100 stacks on each foe that you're shooting at, and each new stack will refresh the duration of all existing stacks. Regardless of how many stacks you have on a target, there will only be one damage line per second, more stacks simply multiplies the damage that each damage tick does, meaning that it is possible to get max one hits in the low hundred thousands against bosses that live long enough for you to get 100 stacks on. The dot ignores shields, is able to crit, it scales with dot buffs, plasma buffs, and it scales with weapon power, meaning that this trait synergizes very well with isomag setups and abilities like Intel's override subsystem safeties. And while your foe has the shield facing towards you down, applying new stacks of the trait will deal some additional plasma damage to them. And performance wise, Complex Plasma Fires has been doing about 10 to 15% of my total DPS on my Delkina build. So if I look at the 2.4 mil ISC run, which I'll be showing in full later in this video, Complex Plasma Fire did 313k of the 2.4 million DPS. So a pretty substantial amount of damage there, and that trend continues when I look at another parse here from Hive Space Elite. In this run, I was just over a million DPS with the Delkina, and Complex Plasma Fire did 159k DPS. So pretty, pretty impactful as you can clearly see, and the max one hits from it, again, because of how the, the trade stacks up, if you're fighting a, an enemy in Elite content that is a, alive a long time, those stacks really add up, and the hits that you're getting from a target that has like 100 stacks on them, the, the max ones from that is just really insane for, for a dot. And for the console here, Lure Team Command, this has some crazy good passives on it. The clicky is a shield disable and a small bit of plasma damage. It has a bit of delay, there's a bit of travel time for, for the clicky on the console, so it can do okay if used right, but... The main appeal to using this console is those two passives. The first passive is plus 30% dot damage, and that is boosting complex plasma fires. And the second part is this plus 20% bonus cat 2 plasma damage. 
That is a huge buff for plasma weapons, and that is also boosting the complex plasma fire trait. And to show you just how much of an impact that is, I have de-slotted that console on this build, and you can see here that the number for the dot is 136. When I go and put the console back on, it goes to 177. So that console is hugely impactful for, for this plasma build. It really helps the complex plasma fire trait, and it does help your plasma weapons out also. And the next thing here is the experimental weapon, the Plasma Incendiary Bombard. This is a really neat experimental weapon, and I'll tell you right now, this is the highest performing experimental weapon that I have ever used. On the Plasma Delkina build that you're about to see, this experimental weapon has had runs where it's done 100 and almost 200k DPS. It is consistently a very good performer, and the way that it interacts with the rest of the build makes it a must slot on a Plasma build. So it does get buffed by plus Plasma damage sources, but not by Plasma energy attack consoles or isomags. It does benefit from the weapon power, though, that Isomags gives, that it does get a big bonus from, from having more weapon power. And this also interacts with the Starship trait complex plasma fires. You see, this experimental weapon will do more damage based on the rank of the target you're shooting. So if you use this against a Dreadnought, then you would get the first damage line, the second damage line, the third damage line, and the fourth. And if you have a firing mode up so that complex plasma fires can stack up on a target, then each of these lines would net you a stack of that trait on the thing that you're shooting. So if you use this against a dreadnought and you have complex plasma fire active, then you could get four stacks of that trait from just the one shot of this experimental weapon. So the performance is quite good. The way it interacts with the rest of the build is quite good. And I think it's a no brainer to use it on a plasma build like this. And the last thing from the Gorn Hunter is the only one that I would say is optional. The other three definitely try to get on the build if you're able to. But the Gorn Plasma Quad Cannons here are in no way a necessary component. These just have a proc on them that is a 5% chance to apply a minus 30 dot debuff to a foe for 30 seconds. So if it goes off, you're going to get a little bit more from the trait, but... Realistically, with it being just one weapon and a 5% proc right there, you're going to be lucky if this goes off once in a run. So if you are running a different flavor of plasma and you want to match all of your, your weapons to that color, then feel free to not run the quad cannons. They are not necessary at all. And real quick, I just want to give a quick explanation as to why I went with the Delkina for this build. The Gorn Hunter that has all the plasma stuff on it is not a terrible ship. It does work well if you want to set up a plasma build on it, but it does have some limiting factors that limit its potential to push plasma as far as possible within the game. The big limitation is that it's a raider, and as a raider, it does have a 5-1 weapon setup, meaning that it does lose out on an extra aft weapon compared to a traditional escort or destroyer type ship. And with that complex plasma fire trait, Having that extra weapon is a pretty big deal. Now, the other issue with the, the Gorn Hunter is that it is very obnoxious to fly because as soon as you start moving, it spins back and forth. And the only way to get it to stop spinning is to stop moving the ship, which is not very practical when playing the game. Now, for the Delkina, I took a look at Fleffel's Sortable Filterable Ship List, which I'll have linked down below, and... It happened to be the ship that checked the most boxes for being able to push a plasma build like this to its maximum potential. And that shouldn't come as much of a surprise. The Delkina has consistently been one of the top DPS weapons platforms since its introduction into the game in 2021. And in fact, it is what has held the ISC energy weapon records for pretty much the past two years. So it is the most ideal platform for this type of build. And for the DPS performance of this build, in channel runs, I have been quite consistently getting anywhere from 1 to 1 1.5 million DPS from this build. And I was able to get a supported run in prior to the X2 upgrades and before 
Cryptic messed with the infected map and replaced the cubes with these assimilator things. And I was able to get a version of this build up to 2.4 million DPS, taking the third spot on the current ISC tables. Now, those changes were basically I just didn't use Uncon on that version of the build because it was a really fast coordinated run where it was too fast for me to benefit from Uncon. And the specific changes for that specific run I'll have detailed later on in the video. And the third version of the build that I'll also be mentioning later in the video just swaps out a little bit of the DPS stuff for some survivability. And that is what I've been using when I've been using the Delkina on stream over the past couple of months. And again, that will also be detailed later in the video. And I do have a couple of disclaimers that I do want to go over. The first thing is, is that this build is designed for elite difficulty content. It will work in lower difficulty, normal and advanced content, but it is not optimized for that. There are other build approaches that are better optimized if that's the type of content that you're wanting to focus on. And of course, with any DPS numbers, you know, keep in mind that DPS performance is going to vary wildly depending on how you fly your ship, how you time abilities, what your team composition is like, what the server performance is like, and so on. So don't expect to be able to just copy paste the build and immediately see the listed performance. DPS always takes practice in stow, and especially if this is a ship that you're not familiar with flying, it's going to take you time to get used to flying it, getting it in the right positions, and getting your ability timings down. And of course, I am on a character that does have endeavors basically maxed out. So if you're a new player trying to copy this build, do keep in mind that one of the factors that may be hurting your performance is that your endeavors are not as progressed. I wish there was a way that people could quickly catch up with endeavors, but unfortunately for everyone, it is a very slow grind. And I just want to quickly recap some of the new meta items that this build is utilizing. So obviously the, the Gorn Hunter stuff are, I've already spent too much time talking about. I'm also utilizing one of the Maelstrom torpedoes from the legendary Akira in the first strike bundle because it does a lot of burst damage. I am using the Tholian Nucleating Warp Core for extra damage on kills, and I am, of course, using the Isomag consoles because the max power buff is really impactful, and it interacts also with the Gorn trait and experimental weapon and boosts both of those massively. And finally, we are at the build discussion part of this video, and I'm going to start off by looking at the weapons, then I'll go through the deflector, engine core, and shield devices, and then the consoles. I'll have chapters listed down below if you want to skip ahead to a specific part. And starting off with the weapons here, all of these fore and aft and the experimental are all modded to crit D damage on the epic mod and damage for any remaining mods. At the left, I have the Gorn plasma quad cannons. And like I said earlier, you could use any other flavor of plasma there that you want. I just went through and upgraded those and decided to use them given that I had upgraded them. Um, outside of that, the other plasmas that I'm running here are the Viridians. So I have a Wide Arc Viridian Plasma Dual Heavy Cannon, and then I have two of the normal Viridian Dual Heavy Cannons next to that. The Viridians are nice. They have a proc on them that probably will never go off in your run, given it's a 2.5% chance to, to proc. But the proc is plus 30% firing cycle haste for six seconds for all Viridian Plasma weapons if the proc goes off. And that's that's always the thing, is these weapon procs go off so little that they basically don't actually matter. Well, these Viridian weapons, they're lockbox weapons, so you can get them from Infinity Lockbox, Infinity lockbox weapon packs, or you can just buy them off the exchange. And the other thing that's really nice about them is the visuals that they have are honestly quite, quite nice to see. So I have a clip here that I'll play for you. And you can see these these red bolts here. These are the Viridian weapons. So if you wanted to drop the 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 Gorn quad cannons and toss another Viridian on, that'd be perfectly fine if you wanted to just stick with this Viridian bolt theme here, because the Gorn plasma quad cannons, those just are the the old plasma visuals. So it's nothing special there. 
And as you can see, it's it's a pretty nice visual. And that that green shotgun thing you just saw, that's the the experimental weapon I'll talk about here in a few minutes. So the visuals on the Viridians are nice. I I like them. They perform well, and they're they're nice to actually see shooting out of the ship. The last forward weapon that I have on is the Maelstrom Quantum Torpedo. And while I know some of you may think, well, wouldn't you want to have another plasma cannon on to get more procs from the trait? Yes, but at the same time, the Maelstrom is capable of giving such a large burst of damage that the trade-off is actually worth it. In the runs that I was doing, the Maelstrom Torpedo was quite often the top damage source on, on my build. And that's even with all this plasma stuff. You, you can see that the, the Maelstrom Quantum Torpedo there was basically doing the damage of like three dual heavy cannons. So it is worth the trade-off. Yes, you're going to be getting a little bit less from complex plasma fires and all the plasma stuff, but the Maelstrom just has such a huge burst damage spike that it makes up for, for the loss in the plasma side of things. And for the aft weapons, I have a Viridian Plasma turret on. Again, you can get that from the Infinity Lockbox weapon packs or via the player exchange. And then I have a Plasmatic Biomatter Auto turret on from the Lobby store. This is a 200 Lobby item. You can only equip one. And the special effect of this is that it fires an additional shot at one random target within five kilometers, dealing plasma damage. My thought with this is that that should, in theory, be an additional way to get some complex plasma fire procs out on targets. And I can't tell you with 100% certainty that that is how it's working, but when I look at the parses, I do see that that turret is getting more shots out than the Viridian turret. If I compare the CSV and non-CSV numbers here for both of these turrets, what I find is that the Viridian has 167 total shots out, whereas the Plasmatic Biomatter Auto Defense turret was able to get 204 in the same run. So it's definitely getting more shots out, and given that it is listed as just a normal shot from the turret, it should be counting to get some additional complex plasma fire procs on the various targets around you. And lastly, we have the experimental weapon. Again, this is the plasma incendiary bombard from the Gorn Hunter. And like I said earlier in the video, this is the highest performing experimental weapon that I have ever used. It is boosted by weapon power and plus plasma damage buffs, but it is not boosted by the plasma modifier on attack console or an isomag. But on an isomag, the plus weapon power would still impact it. It does have an interaction with the Gorn Hunter's trait and will allow you to apply more stacks of that trait. And both the damage and number of stacks of complex plasma fire that it applies does increase depending on the rank of the foe. So if you hit something that is a battleship, you're going to be getting the first line of damage, the second line, and the third line. And each of those lines is giving you a rock of the complex plasma fire trait on that target. So used against bigger targets, this thing can be quite powerful. And for the visuals here, I can show you that real quick. So it has this weird green effect on it. So right there's the plasma bombard uh, shotgun thingy. It has this shotgun style effect here, but it will only hit the thing that it's targeted against. It will go right through other enemies and not damage them. It is explicitly only damaging the one that you're targeting, and it does a good bit of damage. Typically in a run, I see this experimental weapon do about one and a half to two turrets worth of damage. So definitely worth having on over another turret. And for the deflector here, I am using a fleet colony deflector. The reason I'm using this is because it provides a scaling crit chance and severity buff based on my hull capacity. So at 100% hull capacity, it's 4% crit chance and 15 severity. I am specifically using one of the intervention variants for the crit chance and shield pen stat boost on it. 
and I have re-engineered it, but if you're looking to pick one of these things up from the Fleet Colony, I believe these intervention ones are starting at like the fourth on the list. I think the, the first three are like defense focused. So make sure you're picking up the right one when you're over at the Colony World. And for the engines here, I have the prevailing innervated ones from the competitive reputation. These provide a speed boost when hitting firing modes. So on the this build, cannon scatter volley, torp spread, and beam overload are used to trigger this engine. And given that I have no beams on, I do use the beam overload like another evasive on the build. The CSV and torp spread pretty much go off as soon as they're available. But the beam overload, I just have set apart on the tray. And like I said, I use it just like another evasive. And the reason for that is because speed is critical to getting a higher DPS number in this game. You need to be able to get to the next part of the map as soon as possible so you can press runtime and get your damage on the target as fast as you can. And for the Singularity Core, I was using the Tholian Nucleating Singularity Core from a recent event. The idea behind this is that upon defeating an enemy, it creates one to two Tholian Warp Crystals, and those warp crystals will either damage nearby foes that collide with them or heal nearby allies that fly near them. And the performance from this in the runs that I've done has been quite inconsistent. Some runs it might do 30 to 40k, other runs it might do over 100. In my 2.4 mil run, it did 150k, but it looks like there may be a bug that is causing this to overperform in some situations. So if that is true and Cryptic actually goes through and fixes it, then the DPS that I would have gotten from it probably would have dropped to like 50 to 60K. So while this is what I was using on my build and what I am still using for the time being, I think for, for many of you, it's probably a safer bet to just grab one of the Fleet Spire Singularity Cores. Again, I think it's one of the Thoron infused ones that has the EPS buff and the, the minus weapon power cost. I think that would just be a safer bet long term and you wouldn't have to worry about having something on your build that's potentially going to get nerfed at some point in the future. And for the shields here, this should not be much of a surprise to anyone. I am using the Discovery Reputation Tilly Shield for the increased damage versus enemy shields. Not really much to say here. I, I think many of you probably have already been using this shield for the past couple of years, and the reason is because it's a good shield. That effect on it is really good, and it is still good for a build like this. And for the devices, I had the Temporal Negotiator on from the Delta Recruit event. This is an instant bridge officer cooldown reduction, but it has a five minute cooldown. So if you have Boimler fail to go off at, at a point in the run, then you can use this to, to save you. But that five minute cooldown does mean that it's a, basically just a one time use per run. I then have the Kobayashi Maru Transponder on. This is available in the Mud Store also. And this is just going to provide you with a couple of buffs. It's a random buff that it provides you, but there is a plus damage buff that it can give here, which would be 10% cat to bonus damage for 30 seconds. So it's some, some nice small little buffs there. It's not really worth the 20 bucks in my opinion that it cost in the mud store, unless you're really, really record chasing and need every last bit of uh, buff that you can get. And for the next device, it's a deuterium surplus. This is just an evasive maneuvers in a can, basically. Then I have an advanced battery on uh, for energy amplifier. So just your standard energy amps there. And then the fifth device, I just slotted a random thing. But if you were really trying to, to min max things, the new car web breakers from the new car rep might be something to consider. They're a bit of a pain to, to grind out because you do need a doff for every single one of these that you want to pick up from the new car rep. But these are an option if you're looking for a device to slot that you want to get a little bit of damage from. The, the issue is just that there is a pretty high cost and you have to craft them one by one, which is quite inconvenient. And some other buffs that I had running while I was doing the runs are the plus 10 skill boost from the Fleet Starbase for TAC, Inge, and Psy. 
You can pick these up from an NPC in the same room that has the fleet hangar pets and weapons. They're a bit expensive, but if you're trying to min max things and you want a little bit of a stat boost, then they're pretty nice to have on. And the other thing I had on was some prototype of Blade of Jevonite hardpoints. These provide a hit point buff, and you can get these from duty officer missions or from the exchange. And what's nice about the prototype of Blade of Jevonites is they do provide a pretty significant hull capacity boost. So I'm at 109k right now. If I pop one of these, it might take a second for it to, to show up in the UI, but you'll see here that the number jumps up when the game decides to recognize it. So there we go. I went from 109k up to 126k, and that's going to last for 15 minutes. So that's going to also help you get a little bit more out of traits like Tyler's Duality, and it's obviously going to help you stay alive a little bit better because more hold capacity means enemies have to work through a bit more to take you out. And heading over to the console side of things for the engineering and universal console slots, I just have isomags slotted in all of them. And with six of those isomags on, that means that I have 169 max weapons power, which is a pretty significant buff. For the size slots, I have the Lure Team Command Console off the Gord Hunter, which I talked about earlier. And then I have the Immolating Phaser Lance off of the Damos, because even though that does phaser damage, the effect of it is still very beneficial for universal designs. And even on a non-phaser build, it still does a pretty good amount of damage. In fact, if I look at that 2.4 again, the Immolating Phaser Lance on a Plasma build still did about 75k DPS, so even on a non-phaser build, it still performs perfectly fine. And heading over to the TAC consoles here, so at the left side here we have the Sensor Phantom Projector off the Sea Store Cyclone. This has a crit severity buff, and it has a passive on it that gives you a damage buff when flanking an enemy. When you have the clicky on, that flanking bonus is drastically increased, so if you're able to activate that and get to the flank of your opponent, you are getting a very, very large damage buff by it. And the second console here is the Domino. This has passives on it for, for phaser damage, but the haste buff and the damage buff from the clicky are still quite substantial for a build like this. And the haste does mean that you can get more shots out to get more procs of the complex plasma fire trait. Then we have the Temporal Trajectory Shifter. This is from the Sea Store, Narendra, and Ambassador. There's a couple other ships that have it, but those are the two main ones. And the point of this is that it is another haste console, but you do have to make sure you're timing this one right, and you cannot spam bar it. This is a console that can be turned off, so if you put it on your spam bar, you'll toggle it back off right after you activate it. Then I have the Fekiri Torment Engine from the mission Leap of Faith. This provides buffs for plasma and dots. So pretty, pretty nice buff there. And then I have the Lorca console from the Disco Rep for the crit chance and the shield pen. And in the hangar bay slot, I have the Elite Mirror Universe Shuttlecraft because these pets perform quite well without needing to have sat on the build. If you have something else that you want to use, then use whatever helps your immersion the most. But given that this build has basically no pet buffs on it, whatever pets you slot just are not going to perform that well. And with this being a single hangar bay ship, that's sort of to be expected. And heading over to the bridge officer side of things, all of the bridge officers I have on here are Romulans with superior Romulan operative. So I'm getting crit chance and severity from each of them. For the commander attack with command, I am running a distributed targeting one, an attack pattern beta one, a torp spread three, and a cannon scatter volley three. The distributed targeting one isn't really doing that much for me. I would like to be able to put command call emergency artillery on here, but unfortunately I would have to give up the torp spread three and or the cannon scatter volley three in order to, to get that on here and 
I just am not willing to, to make that trade for call emergency artillery. On the Lieutenant tack, I have Beam Overload 1 and Kima Sight 2. Again, the Beam Overload is used as an evasive, basically, with the comp engines. On the Lieutenant Commander Engineer, I have Emergency Powered Engines, Aux to Sif, and that Aux to Sif is currently being used as a low cooldown Boimler trigger. If you want to swap that to something else, that is perfectly fine. And then I have Emergency Powered Weapons 3 to buff my weapons on the build. For the Ensign Universal that is set to a science and has Tractor Beam 1 because that is a low cooldown uncon proc. And on the Lieutenant Commander Universal with Intel, that is also set to a science, but it has Intel abilities in all of the slots there. So Viral Impulse Burst for uncon, Ionic Turbulence for, for uncon and also for the debuff it provides, and then Override Subsystem Safeties for the power buff, which does indeed stack with the Isomags. So there's three uncon triggers on this build. That's still enough to, to get your consoles back up by the end of a run, especially with these being some of the lower cooldown uncon abilities in the game. And for the duty officers here, I am going to hop in game just to show you these in a bit more detail. So on the ground side, I have Elder Malik and Neil Falconer slotted. These both provide a damage buff for space and ground, even though that they slot in ground slots. So Neil Falconer, 5% cat one against Borg, space and ground. And the elder guy here from the Gamma Recruit event, 10% all damage on space and ground. This is cat one, so it's not that significant, but, you know, they slot on the ground. So it's just a free small buff that you're basically getting. Now on the space side of things, I do have the emergency con hologram on from the Phoenix store. When you activate emergency powered engines, it will cause the recharge on evasive maneuvers to be drastically reduced. So when you hit emergency powered engines, it resets the cooldown of evasive. So when you're trying to get around the map really fast, quite consistently, then that is a very good combo to have on emergency powered engines plus the emergency con hologram. I then have a crit chance and crit severity energy weapon officer on. I have 2447. This has a 15% chance when hitting tack abilities to set power levels to maximum for five seconds. This this duty officer honestly could probably be dropped for one of the Borg cooldown reduction doffs or maybe like a 23. Like the, there's probably a different Borg doff that you could run instead of this. This is just what I had on the build. So I, I've just left it there. I figure if it does ever go off, you know, that power buff is going to be handy for at least a couple seconds. I then have 26 on. This has a 15% chance when hitting tack abilities to improve damage over time by 50% for 30 seconds. This does impact complex plasma fires, so pretty nice stuff to have on for this build. And the last one is, of course, 27 of 47 tack, 15% chance to improve critical severity by 20% and 30% chance when hitting Intel abilities to improve crit chance by 2.5%. So pretty nice crit buff there. I, I don't think this duty officer is worth the billion EC price tag that he usually has. If it was like half, half a bill, it'd be more reasonable, but it, it's a good, good duty officer. I just don't think it's, you know, worth the, that billion price tag. That That's just insane to me. And next up are the personal traits. So I'm going to hop in game again to, to show these. Open this up. So starting at the top here is a good day to die. That is really good on attack captain to allow you to use go down fighting at any HP level. Adaptive offense for the crit severity buff it provides. Then there is intelligence agent attache for the cooldown reduction on captain abilities. Inspirational Leader is a nice for the, the small stat boost it provides. I have Fragment of an AI tech on for the Cat 1 energy weapon damage buff that provides, along with some control expertise. Um, there's Duelist Fervor for the damage buff it has. Self-Modulating Fire for the 50% shield pen for 10 seconds, once every 45 seconds. Terran Targeting Systems for the 15% crit severity. Fleet Coordinator for the up to 10% Cat 2 damage buff that it provides. 
unconventional systems for the cooldown reduction for, for, for you, the universal consoles. And then the Boimler effect for the cooldown reduction that that can provide. And on the space rep traits here, I have advanced targeting systems for the 20% crit severity, precision for the 5% crit chance, magnified firepower for the 6.3% cat 2 bonus weapon damage, the enhanced shield pen for the, the extra shield pen for the energy weapons, and Tyler's duality for the crit chance that provides that does scale up based on your whole capacity. So using that prototype of Blade of Jevonite thing I mentioned before, that will help you get a little bit of extra crit chance out of that trait. And for the starship traits, I have emergency weapon cycle for the minus weapon power cost and firing cycle haste, withering barrage to extend the uptime of cannon scatter volley, complex plasma fires for the reasons I talked about earlier in this video, Universal Designs, which is used alongside the Emulating Phaser Lance, and when you properly time the Emulating Phaser Lance, you can get up to 10% crit chance and 50% severity from this trait. I then have Terran Goodbye On, which stacks up to three times, providing a total of 15% crit chance and 75 accuracy. And then I have the Ruin of Our Enemies, which can stack up to 100 times, which would be a 300% cat 2 damage buff. And every five stacks of this that you get does also give you some cooldown reduction for your bridge officer abilities, which is quite nice on an AoE heavy build like this plasma build. And for the seventh trait, I haven't decided for sure if I'm going to keep this on, but for right now I have Calm Before the Storm on. This is from one of the, the Cardassian Sea Store ships, and it, it is a pretty good trait for firing cycle haste and some cooldown reduction. It is, it is very good, but it has 20 seconds of uptime and then 20 seconds of downtime. So it's not, not the best uptime wise, but it is a pretty substantial buff. And when that 20 seconds is active, it is a very noticeable impact that it provides. For the seventh trait, you could also use something like OPOG off the Legendary Defiant or any other haste stuff that you have, but Calm Before the Storm is the one that I had access to, so that is what I went with for the time being. The next thing I want to take a look at is my tray and keybind setup and the ability activation order. The abilities on each tray will activate going from left to right, my main spam key is tray 10, and that is bound to F. Yes, I use F instead of spacebar as my main spam key. It's just something that is carried over from all of the tort builds that I've been doing in the past couple of years, which needed a bit more manual control. So F is what I've just gotten used to using as my main spam key. And that starts off with cannon scatter volley right up front, then attack pattern beta, hemocyte and distributed targeting, aux to sif, some of the Uncon procs, and then Emergency Power to Subsystem Abilities. On my Tray 9 there, you can see that I have the larger damage buffs like Alpha, Go Down Fighting, OSS. Those are on the G key, and the reason that I have those separated is because I like to have manual control over when the bigger damage buffs are being used in a run. A lot of people will tend to put things like Alpha on their, their main spam key alongside their other abilities. And for general gameplay, you know, if you want to do that, it'll work. But if you're looking to maximize your DPS performance, you really need to have that extra level of manual control that you can get by having a separate spam bar for the larger damage buffs on your build. Now, the other, the only other keybinds that I'm using here uh, for this specific build is Tray 1. You can see I have the, the pets on there. That is actually my space bar. I don't really use it that much, but the pets are on auto fire. So if I hit it at least once in a run, then they should be on auto fire for the rest of the match. And I do have my fire all weapons keybind set up on shift plus space bar. I am intentionally trying to not spam the fire all weapons command. Doing that with a keybind can actually cause your weapons to fire less. So if I look at this keybind in the STO keybinds tool, 
you'll see that most of these keybinds, it is literally just executing whatever tray and there's no fire all weapons on most of them. The left control is the, the mine one I have set up right here for a torp build. That's got fire all mines on it. Space bar, you can see it's just, even that is just execute tray one. And then the fire all weapons is just on that shift plus space bar. Now I try to hit that just as I'm entering combat. And then I try to not hit that shift plus space bar too much afterwards. Because like I said, it can cause your weapons to fire less if you are spamming the fire all weapons command into the game. So alongside that, I do have the maintain auto attack setting active in the controls part of the, the options window. What this allows me to do is hit that to fire all weapons when I get into combat. And then the weapons that have auto fire turned on on them will maintain auto attack for the rest of the combat. For the Maelstrom Torpedo, I do manually fire that, so I just hit that on the tray when I'm looking to fire it. I do not have a button to, to go through and just hit on my keyboard to fire that torpedo. I will manually click it with the mouse to make sure I am using it at the right time. And next up, I want to go through and take a look at some of the alternate configurations that I've been using for this ship. So there's a few little changes here or there that I'll make depending on the situation I'm going into. And the first one here is when I'm going into a record style run, these are the changes that I make to the build. I drop the Cyclone console for the Agony Redistributor off of the Terran Adamant. The Agony Redistributor just helps me clear out the starting group and infect it a little bit faster, makes it a little bit cleaner, and it does a little bit of damage, not as much as it used to back in the day, but it just makes it a smoother experience for me. Then I dropped Uncon and most of the Uncon triggers. I then swapped unconventional systems out for superior cannon training, and the changes to the bridge officer setup are shown at the right. I did also drop Aux to Sif to put directed energy modulation on. That doesn't really do a ton for me, but I figured, you know, whatever little bit I could get would probably help in that environment. And one of the other abilities I did put on here was Delayed Overload Cascade. And Delayed Overload Cascade can get you a lot of damage, but it can also completely ruin a run if you mistime it. So I actually had a run that was close to being a 2.5 to 2.6 mil record with this build, but I activated Delayed Overload Cascade too soon while the spheres had too much HP. So instead of the spheres just dying when I hit the DOC, they all shot off like 10 to 15 kilometers away and it basically immediately killed the run. So DOC can get you like 100k when you use it right, but if you mistime it, it can also completely kill your run. And the next config I want to look at is how to increase the survivability on this build if you're going in and say doing some random elites or you're going into a situation where there is no tank on the team. So the changes I would make is I would swap the Enhanced Shield Pen Rep trade out for Energy Refrequencer. I would drop the Domino Console and Trajectory Shifter Consoles, and then I would slot the Valdor Shield Absorptive Frequency Generator Console for the shield healing that can provide, and then in the other slot, probably go with something like the DPRM. Now, duty officer-wise, I would drop one or, one or two of the Borg Doffs for... Agent Rule or IL or the new Dal Raldoff. And another duty officer you may want to take a look at is a warp core engineer called Kiel. If you're on the Klingon side, it is called Tai Heth. And what these duty officers do is they can clean all of the debuffs that you have applied to you. So if you're going up against, say, the, the Vodwar and they're throwing a ton of debuffs at you and sub nuking you, this doff is another way to remove those debuffs from you, and it procs based off of emergency power to subsystem abilities. It says a 40% chance, but because of how emergency power to subsystem works under the hood, it is actually four chances of 40% every time you activate an emergency power to subsystem ability, so it is very effective at clearing debuffs off of you. So that that's another doff that you may want to consider to boost the survivability of this build. 
And of course, if you're running the Disco Shield, like most of us do, you can also slot the Discovery Singularity Core, the Discovery Rep Singularity Core, um, because that two piece provides a very nice whole regen buff that is up just all the time. So those are some things that you can do to increase the survivability. If you're wanting to go into random elite content or you're wanting to go in without a tank. And the last config is for normal or advanced. And basically the only change you need to do here is drop the colony deflector and the Tholian warp core and put the disco rep deflector and core on for that three piece because the mycelial lightning is extremely overpowered in lower difficulty content. That is how a lot of the CSV builds just go around and just insta nuke things left and right in like normal or advanced. And I want to show you now some footage of this build in action. I'm going to start off with an Argala Wanted Elite that I just recorded as I was taking a short break while getting this video done. Not the best piloting, but you can see the visuals at least. We'll skip ahead to after the dialogue contact. Let's go over and ask if their fog might come out of line. Keep concentrating fire on individual ships. Separate them. Whittle down their numbers. We will not go quietly. We will stand down and surrender to Pentagon. Sensors are picking up small habitation. So when that Argala finished, that was like a minute, 27 seconds and about 390 K DPS. Not, not the highest Argala that I've ever seen, but a pretty, pretty decent run in there. And as you guys saw, the, the enemies just melted like the, this plasma build just, just cuts right through all of them. And when I first went through and did Argala with this build, I had to actually go back in and check and make sure I was actually playing it on Elite. And it is indeed Elite. It just cuts through the enemies that good. Yeah, just ridiculous amount of firepower on this ship. Next up, I'll take a look at a channel infected run. That was a 1.3 mil run. So something I try to do in prep phase that I apparently did not do here, but with the lure team console, you want to try to launch it on that center cube when the timer is at about 25 seconds. It has about 20 seconds of travel time for the little shuttle to actually hit the target. And if you hit it at 25 seconds, when you go in and hit this, this tac cube here, it'll actually have knocked its shields offline for at least a couple of seconds. So you can get a little bit extra out of that lure team console by activating it early. And it looks like in this run, I did have like my DPS record run uh, config on and I was trying uh, the Praetor console just to see if it would do anything for me here. So I'm going to back it up just a moment here. Um, like with Torp builds, I do pre-buff during the, the prep phase. You should be hitting your emergency powered engines at 17 seconds on the timer during prep phase so that you have your evasive back up, ideally around the, the time you're leaving the start group or going uh, from the left to the right. You want to just make sure you have evasive up as much as you can in the run. And you want to you know, take advantage of the prep phase to, to get some of your major buffs out so that you don't burn time on trying to activate those during the actual run. Get in there right away and try to position yourself in a way that you can AOE as many of the enemies as possible. 
These assimilator things are a bit of a pain because the hitbox on them is a little bit different than the cubes that we used to deal with. So I, uh, I use the temporal trajectory shifter on this build, typically at the left transformer. If I use it at the start, the trajectory shifter will pretty much not have that much uptime. And if I use it at the left, it's going to get a bit more usage in the run. I try to wait until the spheres are out before I use a maelstrom on the side here so that I can get some maelstroms into them. And yes, my, my camera angle while flying is not ideal. It's just what I'm used to. And as you see that that transformer is, you know, getting to like 30, 20 percent, you need to be ready and hitting your evasive so that you can bolt right over to the other side. One of the things with Infected especially is you want to get from the left to the right as fast as possible. And you don't have to sit there all the time and clean up the spheres. Quite often those things will head back towards the center. So you don't have to stay there and clean them all up. Don't worry about cleaning up the, the stuff in the center either. Um, I usually just fly right past them and go to the other side. Those will all be sucked up to the gate once the, the right side is done. Now with the positioning here against the transformer, um, I try to be in a position where I can hit the two back generators, but in this one, I was a little bit to the left where I, I, I should have been a little bit more to the right, but it was fine. I was still able to hit this back nanite generator, I believe. Yeah. And I'm waiting, I've got Maelstrom available, but I'm waiting for my damage buffs there to, to pop up so I can get a bit more damage out of the Maelstrom before I use it. And that's again, just helping clear out the spheres in the cube. Um, in this run, I had a tank in here. So this was a channel run with a tank, um, but there was no dedicated support player in here, just the tank. So, Megla, who was on the tank, did use the Graviton Displacer console off of the Shran to suck all the spheres up to the top of the gateway. That is a strategy quite commonly used by high-end tank builds in infected runs like this, so that they can get everything sucked to the top of the gateway for the DPS player to go in and annihilate. So I did take a little bit of heat here. I got close to dying, but thankfully I did not. And as soon as the gate's dead, I'm turned around onto the tack cube. I tried to use the Praetor console, but it just did not do much for me. And the activation on it, time on it really sucks. I got a little bit screwed over by some of the cooldown reduction um, at the tack cube there. Abilities took a while to, to recharge. Um, but yeah, that was that was that run. That was a channel run. And it was just under 1.3 million. There was, like I said, a dedicated tank in there. Um, and they happened to be on an Odyssey class. So they did have the flagship tack computer. Um, but they did not have EPS power transfer because they were on a science captain, not an engineer. So it wasn't a full haste nanny, but they did have a lot of the tools that are used in the more supported runs to, to boost things up and get control where control needs to be on the map. Next up, I want to take a look at the, the hive run that I have here before I get into the 2.4 mil run. So this one mil hive. Let's do that. I'm going to nuke the audio on it because I was in voice chat at the time. So with this run, um, the, the role that I had in here was to basically just go in, start at the top tack cube and then work my way back and just clear out the tack cubes while the EPG player goes and does their thing. Now, I happen to be probably a bit more aggressive than I should have been in this run. And as you can see, the, the config in this specific run was a just slightly different. I've got a gravel on. I dropped OSS three down to two to put that gravel on. Um, that is something you could play around with if you want, but long term, I ended up moving away from that. So you see here, I'm just hitting that tack cube quite a bit. And like 
This this build is just cutting through these tack cubes. It's cutting through the cubes. You know, it's just it's cutting through everything. Again, this is Hive Onslaught Elite. Like there was other DPS in there, obviously. Like there was an EPG build doing quite a bit, but it, it just the, this plasma stuff just really cuts through things. And you see on these bigger targets like these um Unimatrixes, you can see the buff count for how many stacks of the, the plasma trader on them. Like it's it, this one's got about 40 when it dies. And the other one, well, it was already dead. So then it's the queen. And you can see how quick the, the stacks are building up. It's probably hard to see with the resolution, but within just a couple seconds, it's already got 20-ish stacks on it. And then I died to feedback pulse, but the run was over. So that run ended up being just over a million. Um, and that's the, the parse I showed before. And... But I think the, the main takeaway from this is that this this plasma stuff just annihilates whatever it's fighting in Elite. Like it, it's ridiculous how effective that complex plasma fire dot is, and just the, the amount of punch this Delkina has, especially with the, the isomangs on it now. Just has so much firepower. And the last run that I want to take a look at is the 2.4. So let me pop that up now. Yeah, I'll maybe. And I was in voice again, so I am going to have the audio nuked for it. Now, some things I need to clarify here. This, you know, this is a supported run. Um, and on top of that, um, this was also a split supported run so a split infected means that we have a player going over and taking out the right side on their own and we also in this case had another player taking out the gateway on their own so i went from the start group to the left back to the middle and i never went to the right side and i never engaged the gate so let's just to be clear this this is a very different run style than what most of you are probably used to. But the benefit of it is, is that the 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 runtime is greatly compressed, meaning that I can get away with doing less total damage in the map and still have a high DPS number because the match was significantly shorter. So, so far in this, I have activated the Kobayashi Maru device to, to get some buffs from it. Um, I'll probably... Yeah, I activated the lure team console so it gets over to that tack cube by the start of the month, the start of the run. I'm hitting emergency powered engines as the timer goes to 17. I'm cloaking up so that I can get the cloak ambush buff when I go into the starting group. At 10 seconds, I hit my fleet abilities so that I don't have to worry about them for the remainder of the run. That way I can have the supporting team hit them rather than needing to take time and hit them myself during the run that is. Um, and as we get to about six to five seconds, I decloak. I've got a really long cloak ambush buff on this build. And I also hit tack initiative, and then I start to go through my damage buffs so that I have things up ahead of time. Now, I did also have an engineer nanny in this build, or an engineer support build. So they did use um, EPS power transfer on me, the, the engineer captain ability. That can be cast on other players, and that was cast on me to give me some more power for my build. And I'm immediately going in as soon as the timer's over. As I'm engaging the start group, you can see the lure team console is active on that tack cube because it takes about 20 seconds to get there, and it's been about 20 seconds. So it is active on that tack cube, as you can see by that glowing icon around it. And I'm hitting the agony redistributor here so that I can just get the start dealt with a little bit easier. I'm hitting my buffs. I am firing a maelstrom torp spread three right at the start. And I am using a DOC here once the, the cubes are about dead, then going over to the left side. I activated the temporal trajectory shifter on the left transformer. I was in this run positioned too far to the left. My ship is right here where the mouse is. 
And realistically, I should have probably been like right over here so that I could have had a better point of view on that back right generator. So that was a mistake in this run that if corrected would allow me to, to probably shave a second or two off the run. So I just sit here and wait for the spheres to spawn in before I use the torp spread. And before the transformer is even dead, I'm already heading towards the center. If this was a left right, you know, I'd be heading right over to the right side right away. But given that this is a split run, I'm going from the start group to the left. And some some groups would go to the gateway. But with the the stuff we're doing, I'm going straight to the tack cube. And you can see that the tack cube just spawns in as I'm getting over there. And if I back this up just a couple frames, you're also going to see that there's already, you know, a big pile of spheres right there probes so the tack cubes there and they're already all grouped up around them because we had one of the supports use an improved grav well at the start of the match so this was after i had that failed like two five two six run so i'm like super hesitant to hit delayed overload cascade and just have a sphere shoot off and you know destroy the run so i'm playing things a little bit safe And that was it. So this run could have been a little bit better in a couple different ways. One of the, the big issues that we found upon the initial VOD review was that when I got to the center, um, we did not have a support quite close enough to me to provide me with a ta with a tack team. Um, we usually have a support use uh, tack team with the team synergy trait. And when they use tack team on their on themselves, it applies tack team to everyone around them. And the issue in this case was that because the, the tack team had not been there when I got to the center, I got boarded five times, which uh, did screw with some of the cooldown reduction on this run. So the these runs at this level have a lot of factors that go into them. And, you know, look, I'm, I'm at the tack cube 30 you know, 30 seconds into the run. Um, actually, when did I get there? So to, to clarify, I left to the left side at 24 to 25 seconds, and I'm already at the center, you know, 26 seconds into the run. I'm already working on the TAC cube in this infected elite. These runs are very time compressed. A lot of things have to go right, and just a little slip up like a, a boarding party there can can really hinder a run like this um but you know that that's just what happens i'd love to try more but unfortunately the server performance is really bad right now and the the recent changes to the infected map have uh really messed it up so these types of runs are not really possible until cryptic fixes the uh the issue with the the, the map completion order so that was 2.4 mil, and now let's take a look at the parse from it here, if I can find the right one. Okay, so one of the things I mentioned before too, um, while I'm on the pets tab here, is the Stolian Warp Core, um, the, the, the warp crystals from it. This run looks like it may have generated a few more warp crystals or did more damage than it was supposed to. And it's because there was all these warp crystals right up against this tack cube here. And as the spheres died, they just inst the, the, the warp crystals instantly blew up as soon as they spawned in. And I think Game Freaks was saying that if that happens, they do like three times the damage that they're supposed to or something. So that's probably why that warp core did so well here. Um, I still think without that, you'd probably be looking at 50 to 60 K from the, the warp core, but you know, just keep that in mind performance wise that if that is indeed an issue that that, you know, is basically knocking 100 K off. Now, this this listing here under pets uh, for attack cube, um, whatever you use the agony redistributor console against in SCM will be it will list as what what you use the console against. So I use the agony redistributor against the attack cube. That's what shows up under the pets tab here. And the pets that I had on, the Elite Mirror Universe Shuttlecraft, 
they did 34 key 34 K DPS in this run. So not that much. And for the overall damage, you can see the Maelstrom was the top performer. Just that single Maelstrom, it just has so much punch. Like, I, I know having another Plasma weapon on would be nice for more complex Plasma fire, but the Maelstrom Torpedo just too, does too much damage to ignore. The Viridian Plasma Cannons did good. Complex did 313, like I showed earlier. Um, the Experimental Weapon did 137k. The Fekiri Torment Engine did 25k. That console generally doesn't do a ton of damage. The point of it is that the plasma buff on it and the dot buff are benefiting the complex plasma fire, and it's also boosting the experimental weapon quite a bit. So while the damage on the parse may seem low, it is still worth using on a build like this. The trap is sprung, which is the lure that lure team console from the, the Gorn Hunter. Um, that only did 2.5k DPS in this run, so not really that much. Um, but I, I think the, the big takeaway here is, you know, that this is a do build. Yes, it does have a single torpedo on with the torpedo spread, but this is a do build that got 2.4 million DPS. You know, before before this plasma stuff, before the stuff that came out this year, we struggled heavily trying to get a do build up to to even like one eight one nine. We were able to do it, but we had to put a bunch of torp traits on the build, and the build was using EBM with us all feeding concentrate firepower to it. This doesn't have any of that. Like this, this is all spec'd out for buffing energy weapons. The only torpedo related thing on it is the, the maelstrom with just a torp spread three. There's no traits for the torp. There's there's no consoles buffing the torp. The torp is just there doing its own thing and everything else on the build is, you know, boosting this plasma stuff. So, yeah, like I've said numerous times now, the, the plasma stuff is just insanely powerful. It is crazy how good it is in elite level content. And I think any of you that give this build a try are going to have a ton of fun with it in Elite. And to summarize everything I've talked about in this video, Plasma has received some significant buffs in the past couple of months that have made it perform above both phasers and disruptors in content where things are able to live long enough to take damage from the complex plasma fire trait. And as I've talked about quite a bit recently, isomags continue to show their value with builds like this, in which more than just the weapons are able to benefit from the buffs they provide. In this case, the experimental weapon is able to benefit from the isomags, and the complex plasma fire trait directly benefits from weapon power. And the last thing here is that the Delkina continues to show itself as one of the best ships that has been released in the past couple of years. It has been an amazing DPS platform since the day it was released, and nothing has changed there. And that is going to be it for today. Again, thank you to all channel members and viewers for the continued support. Take care, and see you all around.